tonight. Um, we have a wonderful topic and we're delighted with our, our guest uh, speaker. Uh, as you know from your materials, uh, the transatlantic relationship, role and perspectives, nicely chosen title uh, is of interest. Uh, that, that matter of when you're situated in that particular location in the world, uh, how you choose to place yourself is, is uh, a big debate. And as we all know, Romania was a communist state. It was part of the, the, uh, the Russians bloc, and uh, it chose to join NATO and then to join the European Union. Uh, an interesting calculation of cultural values and economic and political uh, considerations. Uh, and of course it's situated, it borders just south of Ukraine as you all know, and if you were to stand in the uh, their port which is on the Black Sea and look due east, if you could see 180 miles, uh, you would see Crimea. So it's, it's close. Um, so we have a number of aspects of uh, uh, what's going on around us which makes Romania unusually interesting, and I have to thank our, our member, uh, David Blanche, who reminded me of how important Ukraine is and how interesting it is. Um, the ambassador has an interesting uh, career. He spent his early years uh, not in the diplomatic service, but uh, in scientific research. And he received a, his bachelor's degree uh, as an engineer uh, in electronics and telecommunications. He did advanced study and aspects of that. He worked for almost a decade in scientific research um, and then turned toward diplomacy. And uh, he uh, took a course in, uh, in Romania on diplomacy, extended course, postgraduate, and then w received a master's degree in international relations and diplomacy from Westminster University in, in London. And it is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, after a number of, of early uh, assignments, he was deputy director of the North American section. He then uh, uh, served in Washington as a, a council, and then in Los Angeles as council general. and. Uh, returned to become director of the North American section. He uh, was a, became, after that, ambassador to the Netherlands. And of course, our, our Kingdon Gould was ambassador to the Netherlands in an earlier incarnation. Uh, and then, uh, uh, after uh, serving again in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, was ambassador to, to Ireland. And of course, uh, almost about a year ago became ambassador to the United States. So it's a very interesting career. Um, he advanced very quickly in his foreign, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, given uh, the interesting place of Romania, both in terms of its decision making and its geography, uh, the topic is extraordinarily interesting. It's a great pleasure to welcome and present to you Ambassador Buga. Good evening to you all. Uh, I feel like on stage because of the lights there, which uh, is good from time to time, although I really prefer to look into everybody's eyes and to see if I'm boring or not. Some. <laughs> Sometimes it's, uh, it's very dangerous that because you attempt to adapt rapidly what you had to say and suddenly you lost the track of you know, your intentions. But anyway, I'll try to cope with that. Uh, I thank you for the presentation. I think that I would have preferred to do your announcement later after my speech because you know, how can I compete with Ambassador Ford with Ukraine and Syria and everything? I'll try. <laughs> You know, I'll try my best, but you know, I mean, it's a challenging, it's a very challenging combination there. Uh, that should make me proud of, uh, you know, for being here with you, but looking at this very impressive gathering, I was told initially that, you know, a number of uh, 
educated and interested people would, uh, would be coming, but I couldn't imagine that so many would be here. And you, uh, you can imagine how challenging but delightful it is uh, to uh, be offered such an opportunity as a dream for any ambassador. You know, an ambassador in any very country, including here in the, in the United States, is just looking forward to have people to talk to and to present subjects, you know, for interest. So actually, I'm really, really very grateful uh, for launching that invitation and uh, for you all and the board of uh, taking care of that, but especially to you for taking, you know, some precious time of your agenda and to spend that time with me here. Again, I don't even have to mention that I hope I won't be boring, but it doesn't matter, you know, because as long as we're together, I will try to take advantage of that. And I would encourage you to take advantage of that too, you know, with, with, with uh, questions and of any sort. I would answer to any sort of question. I, uh, as challenging as they would be, I would be delighted to do that. But there is also one thing that I uh, have in mind right now, um, just looking at you. And again, how impressive uh, this uh, gathering and this audience is. I just um, recall something that a former impressive diplomat, Lord Robertson, who actually headed the NATO alliance, you know, a certain time back, and we spent some time, and he was addressing to a large audience as well. And he he told me he he taught me that. Be careful the way you speak, how loud you speak about that. That was a good training. Because he also told me about something that happened to Churchill one time when uh, trying to be nice, which was very unusual with that guy, <laughs> trying to be nice with the audience said, you know, uh, can anybody hear me, uh, especially you lady there on the back of, uh, you know, of the room? And then the answer was, well, it doesn't matter, go ahead, we don't care what you're saying. So, you know, just. <laughs> Anyway, one, one small correction, actually. Uh, I served as a uh, deputy foreign minister as, as well in between, but actually what was at my heart was the ambassador all your positions I held. I was a very, very lucky guy serving uh, uh, here as a diplomat uh, in Washington, D.C. and in the U.S. That was probably the beginning of my career, although I served previously uh, just briefly with, the, uh, with our embassy in, uh, in London. Uh, but then the experience I got here in the United States some 18 years ago to 15 years ago, so a long time ago, has been with me all along and it created uh, a lot of opportunity for me but also a lot of problems because then once I got the American virus it was very difficult for me to readapt back to Europe you know that, that's quite something but anyway it seems that I managed somehow and then that that virus helped me in being appointed here back to Washington President Obama was very kind when I presented my credentials uh, and when he greeted me in the Oval Office said welcome back. Uh, <laughs> welcome back home actually. You know. So he knew something. He was briefed you know, thoroughly about that. Which is, which is uh, again kind of very true. Uh, and uh, brings me to the point of telling you that I have been here for some three months and a half. So I'm still a newly arrived in many, many respects. But just the fact that I served in Washington, D.C. Uh, years back um, has helped me a lot. The cultural shock for any European ambassador who's coming to the U.S. is so great. And because uh, I had that experience, I was able to overcome that easily. Uh, I was asked several times, and that is related and tied to into uh, the topic of tonight, you know, the, the, the transatlantic partnership and the way we see it. And I say the way we, that means Romania, see it. Um, it's, it's about the connection. It's about the way the world, uh, especially Europe and the part of the world that uh, I belong to, is looking to the US. What is this uh, power doing? 
in terms of keeping the balance there. What is the role of partnerships? How is that seen? And I have to tell you that it's interesting to study again lively here what was 20 years ago and how is it right now? Not the world, the US. And I would tell you half-half. Uh, it's the same America and the change America. And to some extent, try to read uh, you know, between lines of what I'm going to say about this strategic partnership. But again, uh, let me start, and then I understand that we will have the chance of a, a question and answer uh, session, and I would be glad to answer to you that, to any questions you might have. Now, the, the topic of tonight was uh, chosen well before the Ukrainian and Crimean crisis started. That doesn't mean that at least some of us in Romania were not contemplating that something wrong will happen. I think that, uh, and that's why I'm starting with that, because what I had in mind initially uh, had to be uh, readapted a little bit with the new realities, and I will address the new realities, but even speaking about the other issues that I'm going to address, which means the transatlantic relationship in general, the regional perspective, the role of NATO, and then the bilateral relationship, U.S., Romania bilateral relationship. Read everything that I'm saying uh, through the eyes and with the eyes uh, open towards the new reality of the region right now. And the fact that everybody, this country, my country, the EU, probably the world, are trying to cope and to understand and to decide what to do further. That's a difficult exercise. And I would tell you straightforwardly, I don't think we have come yet to a conclusion, and I don't think we know yet what to do. But anyway, I think Romania uh, having in mind uh, its position, the regional position, and its history, its connection with the Russian Federation, with Ukraine, with the whole area there, has been for quite some time at the forefront of the ones who were warning the world and the partners that there are certain plans of the Russian Federation, of the leadership in Kremlin, that we have to be prepared for. To a very, very large extent, that didn't happen. We, and when I say we, the community, we have not been prepared enough for that kind of new developments. So, many were taken by surprise by the force, the sheer force, and what Putin did in that region by violating all the international treaties and all the international agreements and all the whole understanding about the balance of international law, the reasoning of partnerships, countries and borders. And despite of the propaganda and the motivation that you have recently heard probably, it's definitely not true. We know that, but it will be difficult to see how we can cope with that and what kind of measures all together we can take. Now, uh, let me tell you that we had to cope for a number of years, a very extended number of years, with a frozen conflict which was in Republic of Moldova a Transnistrian issue that you probably know a lot. And we kind of knew that it is kept there as a frozen conflict or a protracted conflict. It is kept there by the Russian Federation by all means just to keep that buffer zone which has been always considered, especially by the current leadership in uh, Kremlin, it has been considered as a key buffer zone. The policy of open door, the, the, the open door policy, uh, the uh, enlargement of NATO, 
the enlargement of the EU, promoting the values that are so dear to us all here, has been seen by that leadership as a threat to whatever has been considered by them, not only by them, has been considered <coughs> as a kind of containment policy of Russia. So it was there in the making. It was there in the making for a number of years. Now, uh, Ukraine dramatically, the people there decided to take the steps that we have all, you know, seen all, which actually reminded the Romanians so lively and so directly what we went through some 25 years ago. Some of you I see here, Sheila, uh, kisses. Uh, some of us here and some of you probably know, you know, directly that we went through a kind of upheaval, more or less similar with what we were seeing in Kiev. So we were at the position to understand better, you know, what people wanted there, what they have hoped for. The whole issue of transatlantic partnership has come again into light because the question was, what would have been that whole region without NATO enlargement? NATO enlargement being a consequence of the transatlantic partnership, which has been from the beginning, and we hope to stay like that, as the strongest alliance between the two superpowers, the strongest alliance that would keep the right balance in this world, which is a very fragile world, a very complicated one, with the permanent new threats everywhere. And that's why we are today advocating again and again uh, for the reasons and for the concept of this transatlantic partnership, the US and the EU, that would stay together because there is for the time being no better alliance, no better coming together in this world that would provide what the natural feeling of people in the world would be, you know, the freedom, security, wealth, the core values of, of freedom of speaking and religion and freedom of movement. And that has been done through that and through that kind of partnership. That, that's why I'm saying right now that the Ukrainian issue, the Crimean issue, the, the, that crisis that we're facing right now is further strengthening the rationale the capabilities and the necessity of keeping that transatlantic partnership alive. There are various things that uh, have been happening before the Ukrainian. You know, the TTIP, the, uh, the agreement, the, the, the trade agreement that is, uh, uh, is right now under consideration. Discussions on NATO enlargement, other kind of issues, they, ha they will all be touched by this current crisis. We will probably need to think within this alliance, this transatlantic partnership, we will have to rethink certain aspects of that approach. Will we do, will we continue to do business as usual within that and with Russia? I don't think it's uh, any more possible. What would be the steps, you know, that the EU and the US should take together. That's to get that togetherness is right now under scrutiny and it's under test. It is a test. And I don't think that since the end of the Cold War, there have been such a strong test as the one that we're facing today. It's under consideration. Uh, were there people thinking ahead of that Yes, to some extent, I think they were. Uh, were we there, Romanians? Well, we tried to, but I don't think we had uh, quite a strong voice, unfortunately. Yet. We were seen very often uh, as too biased, too engulfed in our own history. And we were trying to convince other leaders that we should be consulted and we should be involved in various decision-making processes related to that part of the world. Uh, has that happened? 
not exactly. For various reasons, we can discuss about that. Now, I went away from my prepared speech, and I will try to, again, address, because, again, I had to adapt, you know, uh, everything that I was trying to tell you um, um, to the current situation with Ukraine. But uh, anyway, what I'm trying to uh, line out a little bit and lay out to you a little bit, it is connected. It is connected to the current situation and also to the livelihood of the necessity of keeping up and strengthening this transatlantic partnership as the best key to solve, or at least to try to solve, the many problems, not only this crisis, there are other problems as well, a lot of threats, a lot of challenges in this world. That, that transatlantic partnership uh, that I'm advocating for, it's still the key element to help solving or at least addressing those problems. Now, as I mentioned to you, um, I wanted to touch uh, base again, except the Ukrainian issue, on four uh, layers of defining this transatlantic ship. One was about, you know, the, the, the relationship itself between, you know, across the ocean. Um, uh, with just one mentioning about the Ukrainian issue, uh, which we strongly believe we tried, even nowadays, uh, I've been uh, going around uh, and meeting people to the extent I could. I had visitors in town, Romanian dignitaries also trying to help me and trying to help the international community in Romania as well. I left them in Washington, D.C. because I wanted to be here with you, but trying to, uh, to convey a message, and that message would be that if, if this crisis is not treated firmly, and in, an, an, in a togetherness way, I mean, the US and the EU to the extent possible, the aftermath, the consequences would haunt us for years to come and will open a, a new Pandora box. Several small Pandora boxes have been you know, opened you know, in time, but that would be a huge one. Discussing what? The stability of the current system? How? and with what consequences. So it is a very, very serious problem that will not be solved, you know, in few days and will have to stay consistent and to stay together and to consult the EU partners and the US and then find all the tools possible to just address firmly the crisis we have in hand. Um, you know, Romania, um, has been a member of the EU and of NATO at the same time, and probably one of the strongest partner, not probably, for sure, one of the strongest partner and ally of the US. And there have been discussions about uh, if there is a contradiction in that. No, there isn't. I think that we, Romania, and I'm bringing the Romanian experience right now into, you know, into that, to understand that we think that we have presenting an or presented an opportunity to this alliance, to this uh, partnership, because we were Europeans. We wanted to get back into the European family. I won't elaborate about that, but that was a piece of history so vital for my country. But staying as a strong ally of the US, the staunchest and the, uh, the, the most solid ally in the region, actually. It has been demonstrated by uh, our Afghanistan commitment, by Iraq commitment, by the way we dealt in military and strategic terms with this relationship with the US. So we've been there and we will be there for the US. And in this respect, an European country and the strong allies and a NATO member and a strong ally of, uh, of the US, we have helped to bridge out whatever problems have been in time between the two big entities. We were there for both of them. I think that we brought, you know, a kind of needed young blood and, and a passion and a strong belief that this is the way it has to be done. So there was no contradiction, quite the contrary. It was a complementary thing, that combination. And that is part of what we, uh, we thought to be uh, defining the transatlantic relationship. Now, um, 
We were true believers, we have been true believers uh, in the need and power of this transatlantic renaissance. You know that uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State last year in the fall, I think, uh, before the Ukrainian crisis, um, addressed the international community in expressing that kind of renaissance because there was a feeling in Europe, I can testify for that, that there was a shift of attention of the United States to, towards other areas. Uh, rethinking of the Asian affairs, uh, just a lack of focus on the European partnership. And then, uh, then that was felt at the level of leadership here in this country, and then that notion of renaissance uh, ha um, has been launched. Now the Ukrainian issue right now, unfortunately in a very sad way, in a very unfortunate way, actually raised the awareness that that was the way to do it. And it was already a, a necessary step to be retaken there. Uh, there are several challenges about uh, addressing this transatlantic relationship. I would tell you something that I felt in my career. It has been taken for years for granted. It is there. It's natural, so it doesn't, uh, it does not need any defending. That's not true. There are very many things in life that are taken for granted, but they still need to be defended and to be reinforced. And I think that this is the case with the transatlantic relationship. Uh, let me tell you one challenge. There are new generations of decision makers and politicians that uh, have been for some years less related to where we were 50 years. Why was that transatlantic relationship needed? Why was NATO needed? No? So there is a natural temptation with a new generation, with a new leadership to not relate to the history which actually explain and explains why that is needed right now. And uh, from that uh, uh, taken for granted and from that a little bit lack of knowledge about history you know a certain different approach has emerged well you know we may do things differently maybe challenges of the old times are no longer there true to some extent but still the point of defending that transatlantic relationship should be made all the time. And I'm here to do the same thing, and I will do that with all my heart. Romania has lived in a dark past. And for the ones who have a little bit of idea where Romania was and where Romania is today, it's absolutely staggering. The difference created about that perspective of becoming or going back to the EU family, becoming a NATO member, and becoming a part, an intricate part of this transatlantic relationship has created all the benefits possible. I lived for a number of years in a communist era. I was one of the young guys in the crowd that in December 89 uh, shouted on the street, you know, down to Ceausescu. I was there. And believe me, I wasn't there for the kind of patriotic kind of thing. I, I was just taken by the wave. I mean, it happened to uh, be living in the same area. So I, I was curious to see if that is possible. I told to some of the friends here in this room that I couldn't believe that it's happening. And for a number of months after that, in 1990, I couldn't believe that it is true. Sometimes even nowadays, you know, I, I feel that on my skin that because I live for you know, some two and almost three decades there in the communist. And I knew it's going to happen, like the Ukrainian case. But I knew, I mean, I thought that it will take a number of years. Fortunately, it didn't. It happens. Again, so I still remember the way Romania was and how Romania is. We're still there where we won't know. But the difference in dynamic is absolutely impressive. And that was possible. That was possible due to our belief and to the contribution of other NATO member partners, EU member partners, and especially the U.S. 
You know, I have to tell you right now, and that's a fact, but it's not a matter of courtesy to you, and it's not a matter of courtesy because I'm here in the U.S. But the U.S., although we are a European country, we have been always a European country, uh, the U.S. is still the most beloved country there. Uh, I think that the, the, the Sheila uh, uh, and Jim uh, Rosepep could tell you how they felt when they were there in Romania. Because then being an American in my country, you're second to God. <laughs> Thank you. That actually made me all, you know, envious uh, you know, on any American ambassador because they can, they can do whatever they want there in Romania. They would be wholeheartedly received anywhere at any time which is not the case with me here. And I have to work very hard <laughs> to get access to that. But I'm still happy. I'm still happy that that is happening. But again, I'm, I'm giving you that example and those examples to realize that how important for Romania was. And I can extend that experience to other countries as well. In our case, in Romanian case, it was probably more profound because we were deeper in a black hole. We were under a, a very special regime and an, under you know, a strong communist kind of system that actually was far different from the other countries closer to the West. But even because of that, we felt the benefit, and that's why we are such strong advocates towards this transatlantic partnership. Um, the regional perspective. I promised you to touch that uh, briefly. Uh, it's about what's happening right now in the region. Um, you know, we are living proof, as I told you, that those key values have worked and are working. And uh, maybe nowhere, nowhere else in, in, in that region anyway, like ours, uh, there is no more apparent dramatic change than the one that we have been approval. Uh, but the additional arguments for you to understand that is related to the cultures, the crossing of cultures and the geographic position that we have been holding there. We have been for centuries, even millenniums, at the crossroad of empires and invasions and cultures. Uh, the gateway in from Middle East, from Asia, from Caspian, uh, the surrounding area, the neighborhood of Russia, you know, for a long period of time, the Turks and everything created a kind of mix of cultures and feelings uh, in Romania uh, that led to a lot of challenges that we had to overcome. And we did that. And we did that. I'm telling you because that experience of my country is relevant. Combined with what I told you about the communists, combined with the crossing of cultures and melting up, melting pot of cultures there. It's, it's just uh, supposed to, and I intend to uh, give you the idea of how important for us was to have that support of the US, that belief that we can return to the uh, basic values that are promoted uh, in the Western world. And we did that with an effort and with the help, but the message is that is worthy and we should keep on going. Because right now we're talking about future. And that brings me into the NATO issue. I was deputy foreign minister in 2008 and in charge uh, with the political agenda of the NATO summit that took place in Romania. We had to organize and we did that, by the way, very well, but I, not, I was not in charge with the logistics. I was dealing with the, uh, with the political agenda of the whole summit. It was a moment when for the first time, the strongest, the most important leaders of the world were at the same table and for the first time with Vladimir Putin. And I was there. I can testify to you personally and privately to the extent possible that he was a very impressive character. Very impressive character. 
He was able to dominate almost everybody there. And then keep that in mind, uh, that you see how complicated the situation is. So it's not only about Russia and its aspiration of a certain part of Russia, by the way. I mean, uh, that's a very dangerous thing to say Russia in general. We're talking about a certain establishment uh, and certain structures there. But anyway, Putin was a very impressive, he still is, by the way, uh, but in a very diabolic way. Um, for, the, uh, for the strategic um, matters there, um, I dealt with the help of the U.S. in trying to convince the European partners to give the MAP status to Ukraine and Georgia, 2008. MAP meaning Membership Action Plan, which was a step forward towards NATO. It was not membership towards NATO, but it was something that was preparing that country. And it was an intermediary status that was giving confidence to that country and was uh, supposed to set up the new framework for becoming a member. And we were dealing at that time, was dealing day and night before and during the summit. And there were two European countries saying no to that. You can imagine how much I'm wondering right now how different the world would have been if that were to be successful. Well, it didn't happen anyway, but uh, it, it relates into this, uh, the, uh, the NATO subject, which is part of this transatlantic relationship because it crosses. Is that alliance a valid one? Definitely yes. Uh, it has to adapt. Yes. Is that a process that is not easy? Yes. But it is happening. It has happened already. NATO is different nowadays in its missions, uh, in its thinking, than from 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But it still and remains a key alliance. It has been challenged and a lot of thinking, because you know there is a summit this fall. A NATO summit in the UK and that summit will have to rethink the whole agenda because of the Ukrainian issue but will remain a very valid and very important alliance mm -hmm. and we have to think hard together the US Romania and the other partners what can we do to adapt and address as I said before in a very balanced but strong fashion to the challenge in hand with the aspirations of the Russian Federation. And then I will uh, stop with the last point right now, and I will be open to questions, um, to the bilateral relations. Um, what? It, it, I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm getting to the question immediately. Though. So, uh, but I, I, I got the point that you are impatient, so I, 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 will, I, will, I will try to just be brief. Bilateral relationship, U.S., I mentioned actually along my speech all the time about that, how special that is. It is absolutely unbelievable. But you know what? I would go beyond that, and I will tell you about the burden that an ambassador, a Romanian ambassador, uh, has on, on his shoulder, his or her shoulders, you know, when there are so many expectations, you know, from that relationship. Imagine how much pressure, and there is pressure, and I'm not saying that just to um, have your sympathy, uh, although I would love to have it. Uh, but that's, that's a reality because, you know, everybody, everybody in Romania, I'm not talking about the leadership. I'm not talking only about the political establishment. I'm talking about the regular folks back home. My parents, my brother, you know, my uncles, my relatives, everybody, my friends everywhere. They're waiting always for a kind of help or green light from the US. That has been there for many, many decades. There were Europeans like you know, our good friends, the French partners, or the Italian, uh, Italian partners, because they thought about traditions or about uh, common origin, the Latin origin that we're sharing with, uh, with Italy and others. Why are, you know, why is the US number one always? I mean, why when we are, you know, 
people on the street are saying, we're waiting for the Americans to do that, we're waiting for the Americans to come, and that has been before the Second World War. Even during the first, the Second World War and after that, we were waiting for the Americans to get rid of the Russians and to help us. And we were not talking about Europeans. Why was that there? Well, it's kind of difficult to explain. It's coming from old, old times, from the immigration, and from the image we have always had in Romania about what America meant for the world in terms of freedom and, and getting wealth and security and expressing yourself freely. And we always believe that. That brings and uh, uh, you know the, the kind of burden of uh, that I was telling you about about you know what is expected from an embassy. Because an embassy is, is, is here to promote that kind of relationship. But there are so many expectations, and sometimes it's so hard to reach and to get that kind of help. But again, it's part of my work. And then just to conclude, I, I have to tell you that I am also prepared. I was supposed to touch uh, on that subject as well, which is the economic, you know, where we are right now, Romania, in terms of a country. We're very good, by the way. I mean, we went through the crisis that actually was felt in the world, started here in the United States, <laughs> and then held by my very good friends, uh, Irish, and then, and then s <laughs> spread it around, you know. Uh, and we went uh, more or less well. Right now, I think we are uh, considered, based on the figures of the last year, 2013, the rising star. I hope to stay there. I'm worried about the Ukrainian crisis. Because for Romania, except the military challenge, the frozen conflict challenge, the stability of the region, it would mean energy uh, and security. We're counting very much on, on you know, seeing what we can do on energy. We have big American companies drilling offshore and inshore there. We are not so dependent like all the other countries in the region of the uh, Russian gas and oil just 25% compared to Bulgarians, you know, the Moldova, Hungarians, the other ones, almost 100% depending. So we are good in this respect, but still. So the, the outcome, the economic out, outcome, which, which has been so encouraging for the last two, three years in Romania, with a great GDP, with a lower unemployment, uh, with, uh, uh, with rates, uh, you know, going up uh, in a sense of, you know, standard and poor's rates, you know. Um, so with the very good signs, right now, some of them would be challenged, I hope, not very solidly, but would be challenged by the Ukrainian crisis. I, I told you about that. Uh, I hope that in, in, in this audience there are business people. I know that, you know, some good friends of, of mine are here doing a very good business with us, by the way. But uh, I hope that that won't become a deterrent because I know that you know the companies are looking for the region and looking at their stability, and you know if it's good to keep the business there, I would assure that Romania, luckily being a member of NATO, and that again will connect to what I wanted to say. Luckily, being uh, it's not military threatened, that that won't go there. So we are secure in this point of view. But then, you know, for the region, I hope that the good economic trend will stay there. And I would be happy to give you figures to the extent you would be but I, uh, interested. But I, I don't want to bore you with that. Just to conclude, and thank you again for the patience of listening to me, and to apologize to some extent of from time to time being so passionate, speaking about my country, but not only about my country, about the transatlantic partnership and about the U.S. And that was my point, actually. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for covering so much ground so well and uh, for saying kind things about the essential qualities of the United States. We appreciate that. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. As you all know, we have to repeat the questions for our cameras. Our first question, Mr. Shore. The question is, what do you think is the future for Moldavia? I, I thank you for that question, because I probably should have addressed within the regional approach there. Uh, one of our main concern about what's going to happen with the Republic of Moldova, I mentioned during my presentation about the Transnistrian issue. And that remains to be seen, as you have noticed since yesterday, the Transnistrian 
uh, region which is part of the Republic of Moldova dominated by Russians and has been there as a frozen conflict, uh, being always a threat to the stability of the whole region, not only about the Republic of Moldova. That region addressed, again, following the example of Crimea, addressed a letter to uh, the authorities, they addressed a letter to Putin yesterday asking for themselves to be incorporated in the Russian Federation. Oh. So the future of Republic of Moldova is uncertain from this point of view. We strongly believe and we have advocated, but we were kind of alone and we were considered at, as being biased in this respect because that was a Romanian territory, as a Romanian language territory. So, you know, I mean, uh, whenever we try to address the Republic of Moldova issues, yeah, yeah, well, you have your interest there, which was true and not true. But we consider right now, and that is the answer, we consider right now that the future and the key of resolving the security of Republic of Moldova is to get them into the European Union as soon as possible. And we are doing our best and we're pressing our partners in the EU to proceed with the next steps that were kind of put on hold for various things, some of them of, with, with, with certain reasoning, I mean, not being prepared yet economically and so on and so forth. It's a, such a small country there that won't create any problem if getting into the EU. So right now, it's the EU integration. We still hope that we can see that. We are not sure what's going to happen with Transnistria and the impact on that perspective. Why isn't uh, Romania recognized in Kosovo? I believe that's the succinct question. Okay. Again, I don't have to thank you for that question because it's a difficult <laughs> one. Okay. But I have to address that because it's an issue of concern as well. We are indeed uh, within the European Union, for instance, among the five countries not recognizing. The, the answer, the brief answer was Transnistria. Okay. So Transnistria, that part of Republic of Moldova that is right now an autonomous kind of region that has always threatened uh, Republic of Moldova and the region to break away. And we have considered, and I will give you also the other answer, the practical one as well, but that's the, that's the political reasoning. We have considered that the president of Kosovo may spread around and may bring other kind of difficulties. And it's not only about that fear, it's about the fact that we have always thought that the best defense, the best defense against any kind of re-emergence of redrawing borders in Europe that would bring definitely instability by the end of the day, uh, maybe a cold war and hot war, and of course affecting directly the life of everybody individually so we thought the best defense is to keep up with the international law principles and that was the argument we have been using uh, there are international laws principles uh, that uh, have to be defended and practically and sincerely again we had in mind we had in mind the Transnistrian case and uh, we were kind of afraid that Kosovo may give um, kind of reason to Transnistria to say, well, you know, if that's happening there, why not with us? But the other side of the story is that we realized the real politics. And for instance, because we were also very interested, Romania meaning, we were very interested to stabilize the whole Balkan area. The Western Balkan area is a very fragile, still a sensitive area. That was also because of the Serbian Kosovo uh, issue as well. So although we had that position of not recognizing the independence of Kosovo, we at the same time didn't stop any process of integration. So we went along in practical terms, keeping up the legal, you know, the legal position. But in practical terms, we realized that the whole area, including Kosovo, the Western Balkans, have to be helped to reintegrate into the Western world and to solve the Balkan history somehow. Now, the Croatian, uh, the Croatian case was a very successful one, and we want to see that happening everywhere in the Balkans, including Kosovo. So for that reason, we have approached at every level 
uh, multilaterally uh, in a very open and practical way, even helping communities there with Romanian contribution in police forces and things like that within, within the international forces to really help that region to grow and to realize and to implement the core values of the Western world. Given uh, um, the fear that Russia has uh, and the fact of an expansion of uh, NATO and Western influence westward, given the fear that you uh, suggest Russia might have, what is the burden on Romania and other countries of not uh, increasing that fear? Uh, Again, the reasons I said it's a very good question is not out of courtesy and because that is recommended whenever you are asked by somebody in the moment. <laughs> but it is, it is really true then uh, because it's a, it's a very difficult question to answer. First of all, uh, there are two folds for that, uh, for my answer. One of them, I don't believe that, uh, and we don't believe that, what Putin did uh, recently anyway, is very much related to the fact that he has been, or he, uh, he felt as being threatened by the in, um, enlargement of NATO and by the involvement of the U.S. We believe that that was his dream to uh, remake, you know, the, at least part of the old Russian Empire. And that was just part of the rhetoric. Maybe some of the guys in time, but I think that they were more or less clear uh, on the fact that there was no intention of a military containment or aggression towards Russia. It was just an expansion, a natural one, of basic values. I mean, we were a proof of that. It was not because the U.S. asked us to do something. We wanted that. I don't think he, in Ukraine what you have seen on the streets of Ukraine was related to any game plan, uh, you know, um, plan or that by uh, the U.S. or, you know, the Western world. It was because, you know, it, it, it comes natural after a certain number of years when you look outside and you see that you can live better. And that's simple as that. So I don't think that what that that's one fault. Uh, I don't think that uh, uh, what uh, Putin did, it was just to counteract, you know, whatever was a threat. Uh, but just, you know, following one of his uh, dreams, actually, to reinstate the uh, part of the uh, uh, empire, former empire. But do not forget that for Putin himself and to some extent for Russia, Ukraine was always, has been always considered as the key element for that empire. Not other countries, but Ukraine, because, you know, it was the most Europeanized the most civilized, you know, in terms of other republics as well. It was the closest to the West as well, so it was a key country. Alleviate that kind of fear? Well, uh, we have tried that in by approaching in practical manner Russia, engaging Russia bilaterally. It has not been possible, by the way. I mean, the bilateral agenda has been for quite some time very limited, but it was not because of us. That, well, they simply didn't want to you know, to extend that bilateral agenda, to discuss on practical economic terms, and to show them that we want them to be a partner, not a threat, but a partner. And that was the feeling that uh, many Europeans had, that finally uh, uh, the Russian Federation got to that conclusion that it is better to be a partner than a um, strategic military competitor or opponent all the time. Well, it proved to be wrong. So alleviate, we did that practical thing. We try to offer our expertise in the region there. Uh, we have encouraged, to the extent possible, uh, any bilateral, uh, not necessarily, but multilateral cooperation anywhere possible with the Russian Federation. We did not oppose to anything. We even encouraged that. We came uh, with some practical offers in terms of doing business or cooperating around the Black Sea, for instance, which is a territory they consider to be their own, and so on and so forth. So we did our best in this respect, uh, not to antagonize Russia, but even to help the West to uh, try to get the Russian Federation involved as a partner. The, uh, the statement is that the Russians, 
inveterately want to dominate the Black Sea and that they would go be, and the implication is they would go beyond the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, okay, the what, counter statement what, is? What are you gonna do about it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's a classified information. <laughs> But the counter statement is that you should have been with me because I have been trying more or less to say uh, the same thing with one exception. They may look at Romania, but it's too late because we are a NATO member. How effective are sanctions? Uh, and do you have any other ideas? Uh, if I have other ideas, sometimes it's difficult to share them with my own people, so you know that would be difficult. About sanctions, um, it's a complicated answer, and I will tell you why. I think, first of all, it's, it is a necessary step. And it has been a balanced approach, in a sense, not jumping uh, you know, suddenly in a confrontation which would get to a hot war. As painful as it is for a country like mine, because we kind of, as I try to lay out here, we're very worried about uh, that ag aggression, which is aggression, a gross violation of any international treaty and behavior. So it is painful, but then, you know, we have to handle with what we have in hand. The consequences of uh, confronting Russia, even heavier, are severe, but we have to contemplate all the options, not the war option, by the way. I will tell you straightforwardly about that. Now, what do you have in hand? Sanctions. Would they work? Uh, we have to wait and see. I think that there are weaknesses there within the, the Russian establishment. The intricacy of the energy equation, for instance, that brings a lot of questions, because if you uh, stop doing business in terms of energy with them, they will collapse. But what's going to happen with countries in Europe? And we have to provide that question. Now, there are some attempts to get a little bit into, into details about that, but not too far. Uh, there have been attempts, and you will be uh, hearing about discussion about the LNG gas, the LNG and uh, the US providing to Europe, you know, gas and energy just to help in terms of energy security and independence from Russia. But that will take time. And sometimes time is what they need. So sanctions, yes, necessary steps. Uh, uh, working, uh, if they are consistent and smartly implemented, they may work. I, I hate to. Uh, end the session when so many still have questions. It's been a, another, I think, absolutely wonderful evening. We thank the ambassador very much. Thank you.